we do have prolonged respiratory disorders in the newborn, we do move on to cardiac dysfunction. Um, you will be talking about cardiac abnormalities in your pediatric unit, so I won't spend a lot of time getting on with it. Um, but some diagnostics that we can do to determine whether or not an infant is falling into this um, kind of cardiac complications include ABGs. Again, um, arterial blood gases, we're going to be doing again cap, more of your capillary venous blood gases, that sort of a thing. Uh, you don't want to do a lot of art lines unless you have somebody who's very skilled in doing them. I've seen pictures of infants who have bled out due to um, art lines and whatnot. So you need to be very careful at this point. At this point, this infant has moved to a, a high level um, state of care. A chest x-ray, kind of looking at the borders of that heart and where you think that they should and where the radiologist feels that they should be where the neonatologist the pediatrician feels that those borders should be and how they are appearing um, an echocardiogram is good and an EKG an echocardiogram usually is going to be your most common um, diagnostic tool used because the echocardiogram looks at just the cardiac activity well usually when we're looking at a cardiac dysfunction in an infant or a neonate there's something wrong with the anatomical structures and an echocardiogram is going to give us a picture of the of that anatomy looking at the various parts of the heart if our valves are what doing what they need to be and so forth cardiac catheterization if this infant is stable again this is going to be taking place at one of your level one on perinatal centers. Signs of cardiac dysfunction um, include murmurs. And remember, you, how long is a murmur normal for? You should be able to auscultate a murmur <clears throat> at less than 24 hours of age before that PFO completely closes. Um, remember again that we have how many autopsies that are completed on people with functioning PFOs. So a murmur past 24 hours is definitely worth um, a look at with an echocardiogram. Cyanosis, diaphoresis. Should these babies be sweaty? You guys know from our thermal regulation talks that a normal newborn doesn't really sweat, do they? Edema? Whoa. <laughs> Excuse me. These babies should not be having edema. So your labial edema, your scrotal edema that you see, Mm, red flag, tachypnea, tachycardia, respiratory distress, all very concerning signs. Renal dysfunction, so if their urine is super concentrated, uh, we're going to be concerned about that. We're going to be concerned about correcting electrolytes. We're going to watch for increased risk for fluid retention. We're going to monitor electrolytes very closely and we're going to correct those if they're imbalanced. So let's talk about thermoregulation dis, uh, dysfunction. So when we have those premature babies, a lot of this is review, okay guys? Um, they have a long, they don't have a ton of brown fat on them, right? So they're not going to have that compensatory mechanism. They have low muscle tone, they're hypotonic, right? So can they assume that fetal position? No, they can't. They're still sprawled out, all right? So their surface area is can be a little bit larger because they can't compress into that position. They're very cold to the touch, lethargic. Remember, a newborn baby should not be sleeping through the night. If a newborn baby is sleeping through the night, there is something wrong. So start looking at your bilirubin levels and whatnot. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't some great babies that are, I shouldn't say great, but there, there are some atypical babies that sleep through the night at like one month of age. That's, you know, kind of my, that's kind of down the, the surface. But if you've got a three-day-old, the parents are like, the baby is doing great. The baby slept for eight hours last night without waking up. Okay, red flag, right? Feeding poorly. If we have a blood sugar that is super low, we need to start looking at causative factors. Why? And one of them might be burning so much glucose for heat and energy because they're cold, okay? So what do we do? We put them under that radiant warmer. We put them in an isolate, and we do skin to skin if they're stable. G 
GI systems, okay, so we can have some GI complications because of um, prematurity. Their stomach is just a little bit smaller. So instead of being trying to get down an ounce, I might try to get, or a half an ounce, I might be more concerned about trying to get down 22 cc's of formula or breast milk into their little, bi little babies. They have weak abdominal muscles. And when we're talking about weak abdominal muscles, we're talking about weak abdominal muscles throughout the entire GI system, including into their gut. And we'll get on to neck here in a little bit. But that's part of the reason why is they, don't, they just don't have the musculature there to move food along through the GI system. So if we're not moving food along through the GI system, what else are we at risk for? Reflux, okay? They have difficulty digesting proteins um, effectively because they, their gut bacteria, that microbiome, hardly got a chance to get started. So risk factors due to prematurity, um, their needs are greater as they are trying to grow as what they would have in utero. Um, so when you're talking about their caloric intake, um, most breast milk, expressed milk, comes out to come uh, be about 20, like 19 to 22 calories per ounce. Formula is pretty standardized, um, like straight out of the shelf at 20 calories per ounce. Um, we can fortify their feeds to give them increased calories. So um, 24 cal and 22 cal is what we, we see most frequently, that they're able to adequately um, be able to absorb. So we'll give them these extra calories. Um, some other things that we will do is, um, and I thought this was really interesting, when I went to Meritor and I observed their milk bank, um, what they would do with their, their milk is they would add uh, various um, vitamins, various minerals, that that infant would have been trying to obtain from its mother um, if they were still in utero at that level of gestation. So a 33-weeker might need a little extra calcium as they try to, you know, um, bony up that little thorax. And, um, you know, a 36-weeker might have needed some more calories. So instead of giving them extra calcium, now we'll just give them more calories. And so they would do these various additives to the milk, to the breast milk, or to the formula. How do we manage these? As I already talked about that, we'll, we'll modify their um, feeds, what they're taking in. We might also modify the way that they take in their feeds. So um, anything, any baby less than 34 weeks basically is going to struggle to take in feeds orally. They have not even begun to develop that suck, swallow, breathe complex. Some of the other things that they can do, um, so we start them out with an OG, an oral gastric tube that's preferable as they are nose breathers. And then eventually we'll progress to a gavage feeding. So instead of having like a continuous feed, we'll start to give them little boluses of their feeds. Um, and then we'll move on to nippling. So we'll start out first with assessing their non-nutritive suck, how they're sucking in a pacifier. We'll start out with passy drops, little bits of breast milk or formula along with the pacifier. And do you know who guides all of this? It's our speech therapists in the NICU. They are the ones who have done this research. We'll do daily weights. Okay, we'll kind of make sure that they're continuing to show um, steady weight gain. We'll monitor their intake. We'll monitor their fluid status. We'll monitor their abdominal girth. We'll talk about that here in a moment. We'll constantly monitor their bowel sounds, and we'll encourage breastfeeding. Breastfeeding or expressed breast milk. Okay, the nutrition content is going to be the same. And breast milk is a huge protectant against neck or necrotizing enterocolitis. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a huge concern in the NICU dealing with preterm infants. As I already mentioned, these babies have a weaker abdominal musculature. Then, in the middle of stress, during the middle of intubation and stabilizing the respiratory system, um, we use all of our oxygen to our major organs and we shunt it away from the gut. This causes ischemia 
and we have necrosis within the alimentary tract of, the, of our GI system. It can occur in the absence of predisposing um, GI abnormalities. The survival rate once diagnosed with NEC is only 80%. So 20% of our babies who are diagnosed with NEC have been given a death sentence. As I mentioned already, we have high caloric feedings. So once we have caused some ischemia, we have bacteria that can invade those, those areas and just live off of that high calorie, off of that glucose. It's usually the distal ilia, the proximal colon, and they're affected on days 3 to 12 of life. They otherwise appear to be doing just fine, and then boom, this happens. So what are some signs? What are some things that we can look for to help us early identify signs and onset of neck? Feeding intolerance, vomiting, abdominal distension. So every shift for our babies um, who are most at risk, so our early babies for the first maybe week and a half, um, for our babies who are on the OG and the NG feeds who can't stop a feed, um, these ones are going to have their abdominal circumference measured, like I said, probably once a shift, if not, um, definitely for sure every 24 hours and more than likely every shift and maybe even twice a shift. Um, abdominal tenderness, if they cry out in pain every time you touch their tummy. GI bleeding, bloody stools, stools that are positive for occult blood because now we have bleeding in there. Um, and then unfortunately, if um, not caught, um, or if you're one of that 20%, we'll, we'll speed on very quickly to sepsis and to shock and death. So what are some of the things that we're going to do? Like I said, we're going to measure that abdominal girth. We're going to monitor our bowel sounds very closely. We're going to monitor for emesis, residual volumes. Residual volumes we don't do um, currently as like a common practice, but if you start to notice changes to other parts of you know your baby, you might go ahead and do it as part of your monitoring of residual volume. So, before you start the next gavage feeding, you um, screw on um, a, oh, I'm starting to lose my words, you, you screw on a, a syringe, all I can think of is an infant, uh, you screw on an infant syringe, you pull back and you look at, do they have two cc's of food left in their tummy, a formula, of undigested formula, or do they have ten? Okay, so a little bit, not that big of a deal, like a CC or two, but much more than that, you start to wonder, why aren't they digesting this? Signs of sepsis, apnea, lethargy, lethargy temperature instability, if they run a fever, okay, um, abdomen, and the abdomen becomes very red and shiny, like this one. You can just see the glow bouncing off of that. So what are we going to do? Test all stools if we need to. We might be looking at a KUB or an abdominal x-ray. Um, at this point, we're going to check for air, gas, free fluid around the bowel, um, dilated bowel, loop a bowel that doesn't move. Um, so you can sometimes see like actual loops when you're looking at your tummies of your little babies like this. We would do a CBC or a white blood count, uh, CBC, um, looking at uh, infection, looking at bleeding, blood gases, electrolyte imbalances, concerns for um, disseminating uh, coagulation. So if we suspect neck, we're going to stop all, all feeds, right? Why would we continue to um, push feeds through, and you can see actually on this, I was just looking at this um, baby here, so you've got the electrodes and whatnot, but do you see also the tape measure on either side of this baby? They're monitoring that um, abdominal girth, and it's always done right at the belly button. 
um, right above the belly button. So um, we're going to give these babies um, a gut rest. We're going to put them completely NPO. We're going to give them some IV fluids. Um, if we're looking at prolonged, baby is able to be stabilized out, we'll still give them bowel rest. Um, but once baby stabilizes out, we'll put in a central line. Our um, nurse practitioners, our neonatal nurse practitioners will put in a, a central line. And we'll go ahead and we'll do that TPN. We'll do an OG to low suction for decompression of that abdomen. And if um, if the intestine perforates and we're able to stabilize baby, then we're going to be doing a colostomy. Um, we're going to remove the infected bowel. We're going to remove the necrotic tissue. And we're going to try to preserve what we can so that an ostomy can be reconnected later. So all of that would be done by a pediatric surgeon. This is one of those um, potential complications that I had mentioned before, ROP, retinopathy of prematurity. Um, so even though we are much better these days um, with trying to preserve and conserve um, our use of oxygen, we can still have this concern, still have this disorder. So what we have here is retinal scarring, and it's pulling the retina away from the back of the eye. Um, and it's due to uh, immature blood vessels of the retina, retina, which are supposed to be growing at 28 to 40 weeks of gestation, so that later half of that third trimester of pregnancy. So risk factors include prematurity, small gestational age, low birth weight, less than 1,500 grams, and then high, high levels of oxygen. So unfortunately, this did occur to my husband. He was a 30-week gestational baby um, in the late 80s when a treatment of premature infants was really becoming more of a new science. Like, how are we going to take care of these guys? And my dear Mr. Michael did not do so hot when he was born um, and had a little bit of problem stabilizing. So they gave him, and this was at Mayo Clinic, um, they gave him 100% oxygen and essentially blew out um, his retina by causing tons of vasoconstriction within the retina and creating endothelial damage. So we monitor all of our babies in the NICU um, every two weeks or so to um, their looked at by a neonatal ophthalmologist. Their eyes are examined to make sure that they're not developing um, any signs of retin retinopathy. And if they are, that's okay. You know, I mean, things happen. Um, I mean, it's not okay, but, you know, Michael has been okay with his life, right? He's He's been able to adapt and grow. Um, but how much better to be able to determine that at a really young age and get them the corrective lenses that they need so that they can continue to grow and see the world like we do, right? Instead of waiting until they're two or three years old when they start to maybe be able to cooperate with an eye exam. So this is really where our advancements um, in neonatal science have brought us. We can't fix everything by any means, um, but we can do better at trying to treat it. When we're looking at our babies, we're kind of going into now acquired infection. Uh, so remember your neonatal time frame is uh, the first eight weeks or two months of life kind of just depends on which algorithm you're following. So again, for you who go on to become emergency room nurses, keep this in mind when we're look, when a mom brings in a six-week-old infant um, who's not doing so hot at home, she says. So acquired infection is one that the neonate develops as a result of exposure to some sort of maternal infection. So some of the basics, okay, very, very basics, include hypothermia, poor feeding, low blood sugars, and lethargy. Diagnostic workup. CBC, okay, chest, usually a chest x-ray. Um, inflammatory markers, a CRP, a SED rate. Um, basically, what these are just going to tell us is whether or not an infection is present um, or a sign of an inflammation is there, and then we'll start to trend those um, about every other day or so. Not every day, 
that's too much, okay? That's too much blood off of these babies. They don't have a ton, right? And then cultures, blood and urine cultures, okay? As we go ahead, you're going to be starting an IV on this baby anyway. So most frequently, um, you know, we're going to pull off of the IV start. I know I shouldn't be teaching you that, but when it's neonatal medicine, it's a whole nother world. Um, spinal cultures, they were doing spinal taps much more frequently um, a few years ago. I see people holding off on them. Um, they're trying to leave them more to the experts now, which I would really recommend and I would really advocate for, for our neonatal kiddos. Um, these kids should not have a tap done three or four times because the residents are trying um, or somebody who hasn't done it in four years is trying to tap these kids. That's a time for that provider to step away and say, I'm going to get have an expert do it, right? Um, like I said, I'm really not seeing these done much in vogue anymore, which is very good because the amount of missed taps that we had as opposed to the number of times that we actually diagnosed meningitis. Management, um, if any one of these things comes back, okay, they're going to be on IV antibiotics. And usually they're on at least two antibiotics, if not three. Um, usually gent, um, for sure. And then uh, if we have a contaminant of our blood culture, we, if it, like if it's growing some sort of stuff um, that's common on the skin, then we might go ahead and repeat those blood cultures. But in the meantime, maybe back off one of the antibiotics, but keep it running until we get a second negative culture. The I really like this side um, on the right because it shows you a baby, but shows you... Um, I mean, obviously, you're not going to look at chapter 60 and whatever book that is. Um, but shows you as kind of um, potential sites of bacterial infection within the newborn. Now, chlamydia is the most common maternal infection. The risk of transfer from mom to baby is around 50 to 70 percent. The most common complication related to chlamydia in the baby is chlamydial conjunctivitis, which is what you see over on the right. Um, they can also end up with chorioamnitis, pneumonia, preterm labor, and premature rupture of membranes. Uh, for the mom, mom can end up with salpingitis, endometri endometriitis, and for her, we're going to give her just, we're just going to give her azithromycin, one gram, PO, boom, done, and she is treated. Baby, on the other hand, is going to require erythromycin, eye gel, and a treatment cycle of doxycycline more than likely. Um, so when you have these babies who are born and they get the eye goop all over, um, this is one of the reasons why. This is what we're trying to prevent. Pelvic inflammatory disease is a potential complication of untreated gonorrhea. So it can cause like a friable cervix, so a really weak cervix. So if we have a really weak cervix, we can have preterm labor, we can have premature rupture of membranes. Um, again, that really weak cervix is also going to be more susceptible to infection, so they can also be at higher risk for chorioamnitis. Um, she can also pass along conjunctivitis to her little one. So what are we going to give for these guys? Um, intramuscular cephalosporin. Torch syndrome. Torch syndrome is really interesting. Um, torch syndrome is um, an infection of a developing fetus or newborn by any one of these agents, toxoplasmosis, other rubella, cytomegalo, or herpes. Um, so the problem with, with torch is basically um, you get one, you're at high risk for developing another. So over here you have this diagram and it's showing that um, don't worry about the seven mils in a red top. Seven mils of blood is a lot. Okay. Cause the roast damage during the first trimester. Okay. They cross the placenta. They cause congenital malformations, abortions, or stillborns. Um, so basically we're going to look at, they kind of have like these vague fake symptoms, but like I said, once you have one, you're more than likely going to, you're at more risk for developing another. Um, so fever, feeding difficulties, small areas of bleeding under the skin. What are those called? Oh, I don't know. Petechia? 
<laughs> um, you can have some small reddish or purplish spots, uh, hepatosplenomegaly, so enlargement of the um, liver and of the spleen, yellowish discoloration of the skin, oh shoot, what is that called? I believe it's called jaundice, and I believe we've talked about it. We can also see hearing impairment, okay? Um, abnormalities of the eyes, other symptoms, basically what happens is they one agent infects the infant during this, um, basically the fetus, and then you can have additional abnormalities that can be, it's just really ver highly variable, but it depends like on the number of various factors, such as how far along in the gestation was the baby affected by this maternal infection. So, toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis, so if you are getting a genetic um, prenatal, or not a genetic, but you're having a prenatal workup, you just found out you're pregnant, you're about 10 weeks pregnant, you go into your um, obstetrician's office or your midwife's office, and the med tech or the nurse asks you 120,000 questions, and part of that is, do you have a cat in the home? Well, when did having a cat be a high risk factor? Once we identified that we had that there are parasites that can be found in cat feces, okay, that can give toxoplasmosis, pass on this parasite. Where else do cats like to poop? Um, in addition to their litter box, they also like to poop in people's gardens, okay, and you can also find this parasite in cooking uncooked meat, in touching uncooked meat, not cooking it. You want to cook it. Fetal complications, you can cause congenital cataracts, um, jaundice, anemia, and an enlarged liver. Um, so we're going to give uh, sulfadiazosine and erythromycin. Some other, some of the um, diseases that fall into the other category include group, group B stretch, which colonizes in the vaginal area and the rectum, and we've called, uh, talked to you about GBS in the past. Um, they take that, that cervical swab, that anal swab, um, towards the end of the pregnancy. If, GB, if mom is GBS positive um, and we leave it untreated, then that infant is more at risk for sepsis and for meningitis. Um, it's not really that big of a deal until mom begins to push baby out. So it's not like baby can acquire GBS prior to, you know, the onset of labor, the onset of true labor. Um, so at the, you know, if we have a GBS positive mom that comes in or we have a mom who comes in with GBS status unknown, we're just going to go ahead and start preemptively treating them with antibiotics. It's usually penicillin. Um, you'll hear and report GBS positive, treated times two, treated times three. Um, vital signs every four hours on these babies post, um, post delivery um, because they are higher at risk for infection. This is the one, you know, these are one of the times where we're going to up the number of times that we're taking the temp. And um, perhaps we'll do some cultures if we've had some inappropriate um GBS or ineffective or incomplete GBS treatment. Hepatitis B can be transmitted from infant um, to from mother to infant by means of contaminated body fluids. It can cause some very low birth weight in um, our fetus or perhaps even neonatal death. So if mom is positive with HIV, <laughs> HIV hepatitis B, we're going to give HBIG and the hepatitis B immunization within 12 hours of birth to our little man or girl. Okay. HIV. So the infected mother can transmit HIV to um, the baby uh, while in utero and by breastfeeding. So in this country, it is recommended that if mom is HIV positive, then we will go ahead and discourage breastfeeding um, and this baby will be on formula. So at 34 weeks of gestation, we'll go ahead and start oral antiretrovirals with to her mom. Um, during labor, she'll get another one, and then the infant will be started on antiviral within 12 hours of labor. Uh, rubella is German measles. Um, so 
when we were talking about hearing difficulties, this is where German measles comes in. Rubella can cause deafness if mom acquires rubella during pregnancy. So if mom were to perhaps have German measles, um, there is unfortunately not much that we can do. Um, she goes into contact or droplet isolation. We do monitor baby very closely as much as possible during that antepartum period. Um, the best protection is going to be vaccination. So your MMR vaccine, your measles, mumps, and rubella. We cannot vaccinate mom against MMR during the pregnancy. So we provide her with education as to avoid it. If we do her prenatal um, blood work and it comes back non-reactive for rubella. And then she gets vaccinated um, before she is discharged home from the hospital. CMV or cytomegalovirus is the most common virus passed through the placenta. CMV um, appears just like like a little cold to the rest of us, um, but to an infant it can be deadly. So it's very hard, and th that's what I mean. Like it's the most common one because it's not like German measles. Um, it's not like HIV where. Or, you know, ha or hepatitis B, where people generally have some sort of an idea, or they find out during their prenatal workup that they're, you know, HIV positive or Hep B positive, and we can go ahead and preemptively have, an, have a known thing about it. CMV passes through schools and families and workplaces without so much as a second thought until it impacts a pregnant woman who um, passes it to her fetus without ever knowing that she did. It can be very asymptomatic, which is another reason it can be hard to, to, um, hard to decipher. But the fetal complications include mental retardation, liver disease, cerebral palsy, and deafness. Um, I remember uh, an infant that we took care of in the NICU or the old special care nursery um, just wasn't growing, wasn't developing properly, wasn't taking the formula like he should. And this is one of the panels that they ra ran on him trying to look for antibodies to see if he had in fact been exposed to CMV during pregnancy. He had not, but just a thought. Um, herpes, uh, in this tree, if we know that mom has had a baby, uh, vaginally and she has active herpes, then the infant will receive 21 days of acyclovir. Um, most of the times if mom has an active infection, we're going to do what? We're going to do a C-section to avoid passing on this infection to the infant. Um, when we're talking about GBS and herpes simplex, um, I have seen cases in both of those where late onset at two months of age, baby finally started to display symptoms um, and it, it went back to, to these disorders. So um, definitely do a full workup on your little babies in the ED. Call for help for a spinal tap, okay?